other places of this state that tune into our service every week. And we want to welcome them and trust they'll be blessed by uh, the service today. If you were to travel around the state, across the United States, parking lots where churches are, you would find God's people. Now the world don't pay any attention to that. And they think it's a waste of time. But to worship our God and to give him thanks is never a waste of our time. We have a lot to thank him for. And we've come on this day to give thanks unto him. Let me just make this, uh, let me thank everybody who came uh, and gave blood the other day for those who tried and did not, uh, were not able to give blood. There were several of those. But everybody that uh, gave blood the other day, we thank you. Uh, then also uh, for the walk for life, I think they sort of double their goal, didn't they? Uh, okay, all right. And for those who participated and those who made contributions, uh, let me thank you for that. Uh, what a blessing it is. Uh, just this, uh, we have a lot of prayer needs in our church family. Uh, but just this, uh, this acknowledgement to our church, uh, we have asked the church family to pray. Um, and we've got, a, we've got a, a thank you from uh, the mom, Kim McGraw, uh, sent a little note, said to thank you to everybody for your prayers for her son, Corey. Uh, she is asking that you please continue to pray for the team of doctors to find out what is wrong with him. Uh, they still, still doing a series of tests and cannot. Uh, it is a very critical uh, issue. And so would you please lift this family up in your prayers. And here's a mom asking you pray for her son uh, that is in desperate need of prayer this morning. I am so glad uh, that we can come together to pray. And I am so glad that we serve a God who hears us when we pray and that he will answer uh, our prayers. I still believe that prayer moves the hand of God. And uh, we're, we're going to a God who is greater than anybody else. And so we... We want to lift this family up and lift your family up and lift the families of our church uh, up this morning in prayer. And we're going to sing a little chorus. Uh, I know it might be a little cloudy outside and a little damp outside, but I think in your heart, there's a whole lot of sunshine down in your heart if you know the Lord. And uh, so we're going to sing, this is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice. And then after this, Miss Christie is going to come and bless our hearts with a special this morning. And uh, I know you are going to be blessed by her. Will you, will you join with us this morning? If you want to stand for a few minutes, you might be here a while. Let's stand together, please. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made, we will rejoice and be glad. In it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let's do it again. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice. And be glad in it, and be glad in it. 
This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Amen to that. Amen. I thought that it could happen to anyone but me. I never dreamed that I would carry these heavy burdens on my knees. I never thought that I'd be standing just where I stand today. I've never known this kind of heartbreak. I've never felt this kind of pain. But you're still God. When my eyes have cried a million tears, you're still God. When my last hope has disappeared, you're still God. For the reasons for this trial But Lord, I know your ways are perfect And you've been watching all the while And to me, you've proven faithful Time and time again And I'm learning, Lord, to trust you even when I don't understand Cause you're still God When my eyes have cried a million tears You're still God When my last hope has disappeared You're still God Yeah. 
and things of earth that caused a heart to tremble. Remember, dear, we'll only bring a smile. But until then, my heart will go on singing. Until then, with joy I'll carry on. Until the day. misery and strife. The soul of man is like a waiting falcon. When he is released, is destined for the skies. But until then, Living in this world, it may take a lot of things away from you, but don't let it take your song away from you. You got something the Lord gave you, and he cannot, this world cannot take it away. And our faith is anchored in him. We're glad. Let me just say a word of thanks to the musicians who come every Sunday, those who record this, those who run our sound system, those Howard coming early and uh, having some light refreshments for those who come. And uh, we are so thankful for that. We're blessed by that. And uh, we, we want to say a word of thank you to them. And thank you for being here this morning. We're taking our Bibles, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. A couple of Sundays, we tried to look at the disciples as a group the ones whom Jesus called, the ones that he chose, and if you're like me, I read the life of some of them, and I sort of puzzle by it because I ask, well, why did Jesus choose that one? Why did he choose them? Then it dawned upon me that somebody's looked at me and said, why did the Lord choose you? Uh, we're not in this uh, by accident. We've been called and we've been chosen to follow the Lord. Having looked at the group as a whole, the 12 that Jesus originally called, it is on my heart to zero in on a couple of these and just look at their life and just learn some things from them. And uh, boy, are they different. Uh, they're just as different from one another as we are. Uh, aren't you glad that we're not all the same? Boy, that's a weak amen when I, when I ask for that. Aren't you, glad, aren't you glad that God likes a variety? <laughs> and we're all different but we're following the same Savior. And we're going to live together forever when we get to heaven. I read the story about a man who was in 
Chicago. He is on a business appointment. And uh, he was new in town, and he knew the address. And he circled, he found where he was supposed to be going. And of course, if you've ever been there, there were no parking places. And so he rode around, circled around the block over and over and over again. Uh, nobody moved their car. He didn't know where to park. He was going to be a, going to be late for his appointment. So after 45 minutes, he pulled up beside a car in in the highway and just parked. And he wrote out a little note and put it under under the uh, windshield wiper. And uh, he said uh, in this note, uh, "I'm late for my appointment." Please forgive me of my trespasses. Uh, and he stuck it under there. He went inside for his appointment. About an hour later, he came back out. And he found another note under the windshield wiper. And it said, I've been circling this block for 12 years. And I've never found a parking place. I am the local policeman. And if I, if I do not give you a ticket, I will lose my job. Lord, lead us not into temptation. Well, we circle the life of these 12, but it's on my heart to just find a parking place and come in and sit down beside uh, this man by the name of Simon Peter. Boy, is he not a character. Is there not a lot to learn from him? If you study the life of Simon Peter, you meet him early in the Gospel of John. He is introduced to Jesus by his younger brother. If you wanted to summarize the life of Peter, uh, in the four Gospels, you will read about Simon Peter. In the, fourth, in the four Gospels. And in these Gospels, you will find Jesus training him. He had a lot to learn. He had to be trained and had to be taught. The reason I think so many of us identify with him is because do we not all have a lot to learn? And we'll never learn it all as long as we're journeying in this world. So in the four Gospels, you find the training of Peter. Uh, in the book of Acts, you will find the testimony of Peter, where he declares and uh, comes and tells who Jesus is. And then later in the New Testament, you'll find in the epistles of Peter the teachings of Simon Peter. Now, when you meet him early in his life, you'd never think he would be able to teach anybody anything. And who would want to listen to him? I mean, because at the outset of his journey with the Lord Jesus, he thought he knew it all. He, you couldn't tell Simon Peter anything. But if you study his life, you'll find that he learned some things the hard way. And Peter's life, if you summarize the life of Peter, there are four episodes in the life of Simon Peter, four journeys that Simon Peter took. In our passage from John chapter 1 this morning, we're going to look at Simon Peter when he first met Jesus at Bethbara. And I call this the way up. And any time you meet Jesus, it's always a journey upward. It's never down. And you'll find him when he meets Jesus at Bethbara, all the way to Caesarea Philippi. His life is like an open book. And there at Caesarea Philippi, when Jesus confronted his followers, and said, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter had to confess. He's the first one talking. And he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And I call this Simon Peter on his way up. And let me just remind you this morning, 
that any time you meet Jesus, you're on your way up. It is a journey upward to meet the Lord Jesus. And I, I wish I could tell you this morning that that was the whole of his life. He met Jesus, he followed Jesus, he learned from Jesus, and he's on the mountaintop. But just like human beings we are, he didn't stay on that mountaintop. From the time that he met Jesus, he was on his way up. But you know his story, you know his life. When he left that mountaintop with Jesus, from Caesarea Philippi all the way to the cross, Simon Peter was on his way down. He went down from there. He started questioning Jesus and he tried to hinder Jesus from going to the cross and die. And Simon Peter was on his way down. There came a day in the life of Simon when he went out and wept over his failure. He wept bitterly, the Bible said. And finally, from the resurrection of Jesus all the way back to Galilee, Simon Peter has found his way back to Jesus. I'm here to tell you this morning, if you have fallen down in your Christian journey, there is hope for us this morning, and you can always find your way back to him. And the final stage of Simon Peter's life is from the day of Pentecost when he was filled with the power of the Spirit and beyond, I'm calling that the way forward, is there hope for somebody like Simon Peter. We're introduced to him in John chapter 1, and I will read these verses beginning in verse 35. It is after John has introduced Jesus in the previous verses, and he declared him to be the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. The Bible said in verse 35, again the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples that heard him speak, they followed Jesus. Let me just pause right there. Up until that point they'd been listening to and then been following John the Baptist. But when John said to them, there's somebody here greater than I am, there is one that is the Lamb of God, and he has come to take the, away the sins of the world. They quit following John, and they started following Jesus. Can I just say this morning, it is a blessed day in your life when you move your following from man to start following Jesus. And I, I will remind you, when you read the New Testament, you don't find John getting upset because his disciples became the disciples of Jesus Christ. And any real, true man of God I will assure you, his goal is to get you to follow Jesus. Got to get amen outside. Kind of slow on it inside so we'll get some outside. I mean, it's a blessed day in your life. Yeah, you know, it's so easy to get our eyes on others and follow them. Uh, and all of us have done that. But what a great day it is when we get our eyes off a of man and get our eyes on Jesus and become a follower of Jesus. And the Bible said in verse 37, and they followed Jesus. Here's a crowd. They, they had never seen anybody, heard anybody like Jesus. And the Bible said in verse 35 that Jesus turned and saw them following. And he said unto them, what seek you? And they say unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, come and see. What a blessed day when the Lord invites you to come to him. And they came and they saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day 
for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him, following Jesus, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Simon Peter, when he meets Jesus, is on his way up. Now there's not a lot of things we know about Simon, but there are some things we do know about him. We know that he was married. Regardless of what the Catholic Church says this morning, their first pope was Simon Peter, and he, he could not have been married. Well, I just want to tell you, when you read the New Testament, we don't know the name of his wife. We don't know if he had any children, but he had a mother-in-law. And so I sort of figure if he had a mother-in-law, he had to be married because she got sick and almost died and Jesus shows up and heals her. When you look at the life of this man, and the reason I'm going to take some time to deal with him because, boy, are we not all alike Simon Peter. There are some in the New Testament uh, we, we just cannot measure up to but I want to tell you with all the faults and the failures in the life of Simon Peter, I sort of feel comfortable uh, coming along beside Simon Peter. When you see Simon, he, you see him, you have to look at him physically. According to our learning about him in the New Testament, he had to be a strong man because he was a fisherman by trade. He was... Uh, uh, you just look at him and know that he had to be a strong man physically because his way of solving every problem was to just by force. I mean, he, he didn't want to sit down and reason about it. He just wanted to take matters in his own hands and he thought he could solve every problem physically. You look at Simon Peter intellectually. This disciple was curious more than any of the other disciples combined. You'll find Simon asking questions all the time. He was impulsive. He was always making statements. If you didn't want to know his opinion about things, you didn't want to be around him because if anything came up, he'd always tell you what he thought about it, whether you approved of it or whether you liked it or not. You look at Simon physically. You look at Simon intellectually. And oh, look at Simon emotionally. Simon was stirred deeply uh, by the words of Jesus. Uh, you, you find Simon in the Gospel of Luke chapter 5. When he saw Jesus, he said, Lord, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. In Matthew 14, he cries out and he said, Lord, you bid me to walk on this water. There weren't any other disciples willing to do that. I mean, he is willing to take a risk. He is willing to jump out of the boat on the water. In Matthew 16, when Jesus said, I'm going to the cross and die, Guess who spoke up first? It was Simon Peter said, Lord, you're not going to the cross. You're not going to die. Be it far from you. You cannot study his life without him being a man of emotion. Look at him physically. Look at him intellectually. Look at him emotionally. And you could not study his life without looking at him spiritually. You know, you know what, what you see in the life of Simon Peter? He's hot and he's cold. He's up and he's down. 
That like anybody you know? They're up one day and they're down the next. Emotionally, spiritually, they're in and they're out. They're hot or they're cold. There's no, there's no misunderstanding what he was like. He'll let you know he was on fire for Jesus one day. And then he turns around and denies Jesus right after that. When you look at him, hear me this morning. When you look at, at Simon Peter, we're not looking at his life to point a finger at him. And we're not looking at him to accuse him. But we are looking at his life to learn from him. To learn about a disciple in the making. A disciple that Jesus probably has to have more patience with than it is all the others together. And so I, I say to you this morning, we're not coming to study the life of Simon Peter to think we're better than him. We're not coming to study the life of Simon Peter to point an accusing finger at him. We've come his life is on, uh, on display in our Bibles this morning for us to put our life right down beside him and learn from this disciple that Jesus chose and molded and made him into a great mighty follower of Jesus. I'm just going to tell you, we may not be much when Jesus finds us. But thank God he's still working on all of us this morning. That's what he does. He takes an old piece of clay and he starts that work and that process of making us into what we ought to be. And brother, I believe he spent more time with Simon Peter than he did all the others because he was, he was such an emotional man. He was such an intellectual man. He knew more than the rest of them. If you didn't believe it, just listen to him. He'd tell you he knew more than you knew. Good news for all of us Simon Peters this morning. If there's hope for Simon in the Bible... There's hope for us. So I've come this morning with this disciple on my heart to introduce you to him. And For the next several Sundays, we're going to walk with Simon. And we're going to listen to Simon and we're going to learn from Simon the kind of disciples that Jesus uses for his glory. We're introduced to him in the passage I read this morning in John chapter 1. And the first thing we learn from John chapter 1, there came a day when Peter met Jesus Christ. There was a meeting between Jesus and Simon. And I ask you this morning, has that day ever come for you? You've heard about him, but have you ever met him? Do you know him this morning, and does he know you? I will assure you, he knows you, and he knows all about every one of us. The issue is, do you know Jesus? Follow me in this passage of John chapter 1 of this first meeting that Peter had with Jesus. How did he meet him? How did he come to know Jesus? How did he have this acquaintance with Jesus Christ? There are three things that are stated in this passage that I read this morning. First of all, you will look at the passage and learn that Peter was brought to Jesus. It was not an accident that Simon Peter met the Lord Jesus. Simon Peter had a brother by the name of Andrew, the younger brother of Simon Peter. 
Now, if you study the nature, the human nature of Simon Peter, it didn't take much for him to argue with you. I mean, if you had time for an argument, you just seek out Simon Peter, and he'd tell you what he thought, and he'd argue with you all day long. You remember it was Simon Peter uh, later who asked the question, Lord, if my brother offend me, if a brother offend me, how many times should I forgive him? That wasn't a random question he asked. You better believe that Simon Peter offended a lot of brothers. He was one that was outspoken. He had offended a lot. And now his younger brother, Andrew, who had become a follower of Jesus, said, I've got a brother that needs the Lord. When John preached, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And Andrew came, one of the first believers in Jesus, who he was, and that he was the Lamb of God. And as soon as Andrew met Jesus, you know what he desired? He said, I've got a brother that does not know Jesus, but he sure needs Jesus. And on his heart, he was going to Simon Peter to bring him to the Lord. Do I, do I need to remind you this morning, you think about when you first met the Lord. It was no accident that you met him. I will assure you, he was looking for me a long time before I was looking for him. And, and I, I go back, and I didn't know it at the time. I wasn't aware of it at the time. But I think about the day I met Jesus, the time I met him, I think about all the people in my life that God used to bring me to Jesus Christ. I did not run into him by accident. I, it was not by chance that I met him. I didn't know he was looking for me. But when I found Jesus, I discovered that he had already found me. You remember that day when you first met him? You remember when you came to Jesus? I think with Simon Peter and his personality, boy, he had to see a change in Andrew. I mean, there had to be something about him that drew him to Jesus. There had to be a change in Andrew's life. And, and so he brings Simon Peter to Jesus Christ. There was something in the heart and the life of Andrew that you could not explain any other way that he had met the Messiah and now he's going to a brother who is so hard and so outspoken and so opinionated. And here's this younger brother goes to him and says, Simon, I have met the Messiah. Boy, I think about that in my life. It wasn't the fact that I didn't know about Jesus. I mean, I knew a lot about him. You've been raised in a Baptist church and you had to know a lot about Jesus. I'd heard the songs. I'd heard the prayers. I'd heard the preaching. I'd heard all of that. I mean, I, I knew all of that. I sat on the pew. And a lot of times I was sitting on the pew, not by my choice, but it was my mom and daddy's choice. And by the way, they didn't even give me a choice. They said, you're going whether you like it or not. But oh, the blessed day when I, when I had a precious godly ain't that got me on her heart and began to pray for me. And she let me know she was praying for me. And I didn't like it when she told me that. I, I respected her, my, my dad's sister. And uh, so if I was going to church, if I was going to see Miriam, I had to go to church. Well, amen to that. She said, if you're going to sit with me, you're going to church with me. Would you believe before I got saved, I stood in the choir with her. She said, I'm going to choir. I said, well, I'm going to be beside you. I'll just go with you. And, uh, you know, I sat in church with her. And, uh, you know, all these excuses, folks can't come to church. I remember when I, I worked the third shift on, on Saturday night. 
and I wanted to see her so bad and be with her, I'd go to church on Sunday morning to her after being up working all night in a cotton mill. Now don't ask me what went on in the service. I had no clue what went on in the service. I, I wasn't there for anything else just to be with her. But I want to tell you when my aunt, my dad's sister who was a godly woman, she walked to me one Sunday with tears in her eyes. She said, do you know I'm praying for you? And I sort of got upset. I said, do you know I've been going to this church all my life? And then she said to me, she said, um, have you ever given your heart to Jesus? And I said, here's a young man, don't you know I'm a member of this church? Don't you know my daddy's a deacon in this church and he leads a singing? My mama teaches Sunday school class. She said, that ain't what I ask you. She said, I, I know your daddy, he's my brother, and I know your family, you've been here, but that's not what I'm asking you. She said, have you ever given your heart to Jesus? Sort of offended me. I wanted to say, go check the church rolls. My name's on there, been on there. But I left that church that day with those words in my heart. When you're going to give your heart to Jesus, when you're going to give your life to Jesus. I sort of talked to Jesus all week long. Do you believe that? I talked to him all week long. I said, Lord, do you, do you know, do you, you remember when I joined the church? He wasn't interested in what I was saying about that. Uh, he didn't want to hear that. And uh, for a week, I just talked to him. I, I just talked to him. And uh, I, I was, you know, been raised in church. He's supposed to know everything. And uh, raised in the home of a deacon, you, you think you know everything. I found out there's some things I knew that I shouldn't have known. But I, I sort of said to God, you, you know what I could have done right in that moment? I could have said, Lord, Right now, I'm giving my life to you. But I sort of made God a promise. I said, God, if you'll let me live for another week, when I go back to church next Sunday, I promise you I'll give my life to you. God was so merciful and graceful to me that he let me come back the next Sunday. Guess what? When I walked into that country Baptist church, the last thing in my mind was giving my heart to Jesus. I'd forgot all about it, but oh, blessed day, he didn't forget what I said to him. And I sat far as back as I could on the back row, and I was hiding behind the person in front of me when the Lord showed up in the pew where I was. I want to tell you, somebody had talked to me and prayed for me, but the blessed Holy Spirit came to me and said, Son, this is your day to give your life to Jesus. I really believe, I really believe when I stepped out of that pew. Don't ask me what all went on. I, I can't tell you. When I stepped out of that pew, I believe before I ever got down on my knees, the Lord had already done the work in my heart. And all I need to do is get on my knees in that altar and thank him for saving my soul. And I look at all the people in my life that God used to bring me to Jesus. I want to tell you, you didn't get there by accident. You didn't get there on your own. God used other people. And can you believe in the life of Simon, this old rugged fisherman? And I bet there's some of them that said, you don't mess with him. He'll cuss you out. Oh, for you sophisticated people, he'll curse you out. I, I, I forgot. Maybe you understand that. <laughs> That's the type of person he was. But Andrew knew if I can just get him to Jesus, oh, Jesus will take him in. And on this day he met Jesus, he didn't get there by accident. Had a young, timid brother who said, if I, can, I can't help him, I can't change him. But if I can get him to Jesus, Jesus will change him. Do you know you can't change anybody? And the Lord never called you to save anybody? But I know one that is the Savior, and if you can just get him to Jesus, he'll do the saving. 
Amen. He'll do what you cannot do. He'll do for you. He'll do for that person what nobody else can do. And he was brought to Jesus by his brother. This is how he met him. I've got a brother this morning living way down in South Carolina. You wouldn't know he is my brother. He just is opposite from me. He's the quiet, soft-spoken one. <laughs> He's my older brother. But before I, before I met Jesus, raised in the same family, he didn't do a lot of things I did. But he had met the Lord. And right, about a week before I met the Lord, he, he said to me, he said, you know, I, I've given my life to Jesus. My family is going to start serving Jesus. That's all he said to me. And I was sort of shocked, I thought, well, you know, for him to say that. I mean, my own brother said that. But those simple words, it wasn't, wasn't like my aunt. I mean, she was, a, I mean, she was, she was bold and she was loud. I don't know where I got that from. But she, but she was, uh, and she was the one weeping over me. But I look at a mom and a dad and a family and friends and people who went to church to, that it lifted me up to the Lord and every bit of that brought me to Jesus Christ. They could not save me, but they got me to the one who could save me. And when Simon Peter meets Jesus, he is brought to Jesus. Do you have somebody this morning on your heart? that needs to get to Jesus? I'm going to tell you, I appreciate folks getting them to church and getting them around Christian people. But I was raised in church, but that won't change your life. It may make a little improvement, but I'll tell you what will make a transformation in your life is when you get to Jesus Christ because he is the Savior. And si Simon just, he wasn't naturally one going to find Jesus but his brother, there had to be such a change in Andrew's life. We're going to preach about Andrew tonight, what kind of man he was. Had to be a, something in his life. He said, I've never seen him like this before. And the Bible says that he brought him to Jesus. God may want to use you to bring somebody to Jesus may want to use you to bring somebody to Jesus. I, I will point out, not only was he brought to Jesus, but he was beheld by Jesus. If you'll notice verse 40 and 41, one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and said unto him, wasn't just a few words he said to him. Do you, do you know you don't have to preach a sermon to anybody? You don't have to say a lot to anybody. He said unto him, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. When he got him to Jesus, man, his work was over. And Jesus beheld him. That statement there is that Jesus looked right into the heart, right into the eyes, and right into the soul of Simon Peter. It's one thing for your brother to look at you. It's another thing for the preacher to look at you. But brother, it is something different when Jesus looks at you. When you find that Jesus is looking at you. I believe nobody had ever looked at Simon like Jesus did that day. 
But the Bible said Jesus looked at him. Do you know he's looking for sinners this morning? We may not be looking for sinners, but he's looking for them. And when he finds them, he looks at them. That word beheld means it wasn't a casual, he just wasn't just one among the crowd. I mean, he looked down into the heart of Simon Peter. You ever felt that? You ever, you ever experienced that? I'm going to tell you, when you knew there were eyes on you, that wasn't the preacher's eyes. You ever experienced that when you felt like somebody's looking at you? I want to tell you who it is. It's Jesus. Jesus beheld him, the Bible said. He was brought to Jesus. Oh, that's our job. He was beheld by Jesus. And I want you to listen to it now. He was blessed by Jesus. For when Jesus saw him, he said unto him, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. By the way, Simon, I know who you are. Nobody had to tell me who you were. And this morning you may be listening to me, or this afternoon you listen to me, and you may not know Jesus, but could I tell you, he knows you. He knows your name. He knows your nature. He knows your need. He knows you. And he said, Simon, I know who you are. Up at that point, there wasn't much to brag on about Peter. Thou art Simon the son of Jonah. And I'm not going to leave you like you are. You're not going to be that same man again. You shall be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Can you imagine the shock that Simon Peter for somebody he had never met before, exposed his heart to who he really was. And his eyes were upon him and the impact that came from that meeting with Jesus. Jesus sees us and he knows us, but he does not turn us away. I think if there's one could be disqualified, it'd be this man, Simon Peter. Who'd want to put up, who'd want a Simon Peter in your church? I mean, who'd want a cussing sailor in your church? Don't you get quiet on me out there. I told you, we wasn't studying the life of Simon to point a finger at him. We're, we're studying his life to identify with him and come along beside him and say we're not any better than Simon Peter was. The only difference in our life is the day we met Jesus Christ. And he made a difference in our heart and in our life. And he met him and Jesus beheld him and on this day Jesus blessed him. And I will tell you this morning, the day that you met Jesus Christ is the most blessed day in your life. If you've ever met him. Jesus met him and said, you're, you're, going to be, you're going to be like a stone. What did Peter do about that? He met him. He called him. He blessed him. I've got a passage I'll read for you in the Gospel of Matthew. Gospel of Matthew chapter 4 gives us a little insight to this man. A lot to learn about him. He's so... Uh, I, I mean, you, you can't get him in one study. Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 18. Remember this scene in Matthew chapter 4. It's a little later. You say, what did Simon Peter do after he met Jesus? Well, he did like what a lot of us do. You, you meet Jesus, and you, uh, you got a job, you got a family. And you get up and you go back and work. 
That's what Simon, he had a fishing business. He had a boat. He had others in his fishing business. And Simon Peter, by the way, could I tell you, meeting Jesus does not mean you have no other responsibilities in this world. Simon Peter had a family. He had a fishing business. Man, the day I met Jesus didn't mean I could say, well, I'm not going to work anymore. I met Jesus. I'm just going to sit down and do nothing. I'm going to tell you, that ain't what the Bible says. What you do is go back doing, working where you work, but you got Jesus with you. That's the thing. You're carrying Jesus with you. Boy, I, I, I remember, I remember. I've had a chance this week to relive those days. And I want to tell you, Monday morning came, I had to get right up and go back to work. But sometime later, when Simon Peter has been following Jesus, I, I want you to listen to what the Scripture said about him. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 through 22. Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee. I mean, that's where their livelihood was, on the sea. And he saw these two brothers, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother. This is at a later date. He saw them casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, listen to it, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed Jesus. There came that time in the life of Simon Peter. And I take it from reading the Bible, he had a very thriving fishing business. There came that day after meeting Jesus with all of his heart, there came a day he had to start following Jesus. And it's one thing to meet him. It's another thing for you to learn how to follow Jesus. Many have met him, but they have not followed him. You see, faith always produces in your heart a desire to follow Jesus. I'm going to be honest with you. When I met him, I really didn't know how to follow him. I thought following Jesus, if I just show up at the church house, nobody's going to criticize me because they hadn't seen me around too much. And, uh, but it was, it was over a period of time I learned that I was supposed to be a disciple. I was to be a learner. I was supposed to start following Jesus. You know what Jesus wanted to do? He wanted to take those early disciples and pour his life into them and prepare them because he was not going to be here forever and they were going to be the ones on this earth to carry on his work. Somebody said the Lord has no hands but our hands. He has no feet but our feet. He has no voice but our voice. And I will assure you this morning, there's a reason he saved you. There is a purpose behind it. And somewhere along the line, you have to start following Jesus. You have to get it in your heart that you're going to follow Jesus. Simon Peter, boy, that cost him something. I mean, he had a fishing business. I mean, he, he had boats. He had workers. And Jesus said, if you will follow me, oh, Simon, I'll give you a greater ministry. You'll not be out there fishing for fish, 
But if you follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And the scripture said straightway, they left their nets and they started following him. Aren't you blessed to the day that you started following Jesus? It'll make a difference in your life. Simon Peter has met him. Simon Peter is called to follow him. Can I make this statement this morning? Everybody that has ever met Jesus has been issued a call to follow Jesus. There, there, are no, there are no disciples that, uh, I mean, there are no people meeting Jesus. Somewhere in their heart, they have got a desire to follow him. I mean, that wasn't in my heart before, but when I met him, and I understood who he was and what he'd done for me, I'm just going to tell you, I didn't know how. And of course, I grew up in a day when you didn't have much training in the church, you didn't have much teaching in the church, you didn't have much discipleship going on in the church. If you followed Jesus, you had to get it on your own. Now, I'll tell you, I struggled with that for, for a while. I didn't know how to get it on my I didn't know how to read this Bible. I didn't know how to study the Bible. I didn't know how to pray. I wanted to, and I did it in my private life. I had to learn to pray. I had to learn how to open this Bible and let God speak to me. But in my feeble way and faltering way, I started following Jesus. I know it'd be hard for you to believe that I wasn't very outspoken when I start, first started following Jesus. You think I've always been like this? No, I ain't always been like this. I worked in a plant. I worked in an office. I worked around a bunch of men that uh, did not know the Lord. And here I am, a young married man stuck right in an office, in a whole office building with a supervisor and, and other co-workers. And it wasn't long they found out what had happened to me. And... Uh, so some of my co-workers, they started popping questions to me, asking me all kinds of Bible questions. And I soon learned they went to church, but they didn't know the Lord. And they knew their Bible, but they didn't know the Lord. So they wanted to question me, and sometime when I didn't have the answer, and they said, I thought you got saved. I thought you went to church. You know what that made me do? It didn't make me mad. It made me go home and get my Bible open and start reading in my Bible and try to learn what this Bible says. And then we had occasion where you got an office full of folks that, uh, that don't know the Lord. You know the conflict and, the, and, the, and all this stuff that goes on, you know. And uh, I wish I could stand here and tell you this morning, I handled every bit of it just like a perfect child of God. Because <laughs> I tell you, a lot of times I was just in the flesh. I was who I was before in this flesh. And I saw that there's a conflict going on one day, and my supervisor, I'll never forget it, pulled me into his office. And out of that man's mouth were some of the most convicting words to my heart. He said to me, I know that you got saved. And I really thought, this is what he said, I really thought out of all the people in this office that you wouldn't respond like the rest of them did. I thought you would act like a Christian. Oh, Lord. Son, I'm going to tell you, I wanted to crawl on my hands and knees out of that office. I thought I've never heard a sermon that convict me more than that. And here's a man who said, I thought you were a believer and that you, you would not respond like the rest of them, but I did. 
I want to tell you, talk, you talking about getting me on my knees when I got home and confessing to the Lord and getting my Bible open and found, find out what the Lord wanted me to do. And I, I became a follower of Jesus and could have just say this. There are a lot of people that are trying to tell you how you ought to follow Jesus. Now, you look at me like, well, ain't nobody ever told me. I don't tell you, it wasn't long after that. I got plenty of advice. I mean, I started people trying to tell me what I ought to do, that they wouldn't do, and how to follow Jesus, and what I ought to do about church, and what I ought to do about prayer. And, and you know, I'd so overcome with that, so overcome with that. And they had plenty of advice to tell me what I ought to be doing in the Christian life. In my heart, I said, do you know I'm just a newborn babe, and I don't even know how to walk yet. I'm just going to tell you there's come a day in your life like Simon Peter. He wasn't much when Jesus found him. But boy, did he start working on him. Got to ask you this morning, is he working on you? I just got news for you. There ain't nobody in this building out in the parking lot that'll hear me over the internet. There's not a one of you don't need some work done on us. And I will assure you, Jesus, if he loved you and saved you, he'll do the working on us. And our kids sing it from time to time. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. He's still working on us. Simon Peter, when he first meets Jesus, he's on his way up. Oh, what a journey. He's going to arrive on the mountaintop with Jesus. And boldly, before everybody, he confesses Jesus. And he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's where he wants to get you this morning. That's where he wants to get me. And I can say this morning, I've been a Christian for many years, but can I tell you this morning, he's still working on me. I confess to him, I'm not perfect. And I got, I got sad news for you. You're not perfect either. Could I just let you in on that? I don't care how much your husband or your wife tells you how perfect you are. I'm just going to tell you in the sight of God, you're not perfect this morning and neither am I. But hallelujah, there was a day I met Jesus. <laughs> I met him and he met me. And I started out on those first steps of following Jesus. Next Sunday morning, we'll follow Simon in this beginning of his journey with Jesus. We're going to find out real life disciple. Would you stand with me this morning? We'll bow our heads together. I do not know his heart but mine I don't know those out in the parking lot those across the road I do not know those people that will turn on their computer today, tomorrow and they'll run up on this service they all discover that Jesus has been looking for them. And Jesus wants to save them. He indeed is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And our prayer is that they'll not just get to a preacher. And they'll just not get to a church even though that's good. The only thing that'll change them is they, they get to Jesus. So, Father, we pray this morning. Would you please, would you please take these words, take your word for us who know you. Maybe this morning has been a time for us just to remember and to reflect that day we met Jesus. 
What a wonderful day it was. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. You can't ever forget that day. You want to be reminded of that day when we met you. How you came into our life. And you made a new person out of us. Lord, we have to confess this morning we're not all that we should be. And we're not all that we will be. But thank you, Lord, we're not what we used to be. You made a change in our heart. Thank you for the promise we have. One day we'll be complete. We're going to have a perfect body. And we're going to be in a perfect city. We're going to serve and worship a perfect God. This morning we want to take it. We do love you. Thankful for that. If you don't know it, you don't know it. 